Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Concurrent Session 1.1. Our session this evening is titled Addressing Emerging Issues, Digital Divide, Polarization, and the Emergence of New Ethics and Digital Citizenship. My name is Kevin Kester, and I am Associate Professor of Education at Seoul National University. I will be the moderator this evening. This evening, we have three paper presentations by Gabenga Sasan, Sun Young Byun, and Diego Monrique. As an overview, each presenter will present for approximately 20 minutes. And following their presentations, we will then have comments from our discussant, Rachel Parker, for approximately 10 minutes. She's going to pull out some common themes across the presentations and raise questions for our presenters. For the audience, during the presentations, please put your comments and questions into the chat box. And at the end of the session, if there is time, we will then open up the floor to some of the questions from the audience. Now, let me briefly introduce each of our presenters. Our first presenter is Gabenga Sasan. He is executive director of the Paradigm Initiative, a pan-African social enterprise working on digital inclusion and digital rights. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford University. He studied electronic and electrical engineering at Obafemi Awolowo University and completed executive education programs at Lagos Business School. New York Group for Technology Transfer, Oxford University, Harvard University, Stanford University, Santa Clara University, and the University of the Pacific. He was listed by CNN as one of the top 10 African tech voices on Twitter and by Ventures Africa as one of the 40 African legends under 40. Our second presenter is Sun Young Byun. He is professor of education at So National University of Education. His research interests fall under the areas of environmental, food, bioethical, and robot ethics, ethical theory, and moral education. He is currently pursuing research in ethical issues of AI and robots and philosophy for children. He is currently the general director of the Center of Philosophy for Children and president of the Korean Association of Ethics, as well as many other accolades. Our third presenter is Diego Monrique. He is the coordinating core team member of the Global Citizenship Education Youth Network, an international and independent youth-led organization that works with youth organizations around the globe to advance global citizenship education and empower youth at all levels. He comes from Guatemala and studied international relations and political science in the National University in his country. He also has a background in journalism, and he works with different local and international organizations on strengthening youth capacities and leadership development. He has also worked with cooperation agencies to provide technical support to young political leaders in Central America to effectively influence politics and strengthen democratic regimes. For the past seven years, he has been actively involved in advancing global citizenship education through multicultural understanding initiatives. And our discussant this evening is Rachel Parker. She is a senior research fellow in the Educational Monitoring and Research Division at the Australian Council for Educational Research. Rachel has consulted, lectured, and published articles in Australia and internationally on intercultural competence, global citizenship, and global learning, pedagogy, and practice. For the Southeast Asia Primary Learning Metrics, Rachel led a team to design a global citizenship assessment framework for the ASEAN region, for SOMO and UNICEF, and to analyze the curricula of nine ASEAN member nations. This work builds upon Rachel's understanding of culturally responsive education and research on how global learning fosters intercultural competence and reduces prejudice. At the University of Melbourne, Rachel's research informed the evaluation of Australia's largest international school partnerships program. 
She brings 20 years experience leading educational improvement programs funded by UNICEF, DFAT, and Asian Development Bank and the World Bank in the areas of primary and basic education, curriculum, teacher professional development, and assessment. And with that, those are our speakers and our discussant this evening. We will now turn the floor over to Gabenga Susan, who will give us our first presentation. Gabenga, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to have this conversation this, well, it's afternoon for me, I know it's morning for some and it's evening for some uh, over the next 19 minutes. Um, it's a topic very dear to me, you know, and, and I'll say a bit about why it's dear to me, bridging the digital divide and addressing emerging issues. We are right, and I hope at the, you know, about the end of, of a global pandemic, um, and, and at the beginning of it, we, you know, we saw very clearly some of the issues that we had been talking about in theory, we saw it in practical terms. Uh, we saw how, you know, the bottom 70% literally were not just disconnected, but were disconnected not just to the internet, but also to opportunities because you could only study, you could only go to work, you could only connect with family if you were connected uh, to the internet. And, and when, when I talk about the digital divide, I'm, I'm referring to various elements, uh, not just access, right? Uh, access is important. If you don't have access, you can't, uh, during a lockdown, talk to people, you can't go to school, you can't learn. Uh, and by the way, uh, you can see the lady in the screen, uh, the girl being taught by our teacher. Now, this girl is learning on the computer, uh, and you can tell that, of course, during the pandemic and during the lockdowns in particular, this girl would be able to learn. But imagine many other girls like her. Imagine many other boys who are not able to learn because they don't have access. So it means they've lost the opportunity to learn and lost access to the internet. Affordability is something else. Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, you know, this, this tiny device, uh, which is as effective, uh, many of you know about Raspberry Pis and other devices that are, you know, sort of low cost and that allow, you know, people in the global south to be able to get connected uh, to, you know, access and to devices, but affordability is still a question that we need to address. Uh, I know we've talked at some point about getting soft hundred dollar devices. Uh, that didn't work with the one laptop at chart project, but we still need to continue to have conversations about this. And not just affordability, but also proficiency and acceptance. And, and when I talk about, uh, you know, uh, you know, proficiency is very clear uh, in terms of, you know, how people are able to use this to improve their own efficiency and to be able to learn how to use it and the tricks and traits of how to do that, but also acceptance. How are we able to convince the woman who sells banana in the market and is using the process to send our son to school and to make sure that our daughter is able to attend school at the same time? How do we make our accept the fact that investing in technology is not, uh, you know, in direct competition with the next meal, which of course is something she will take, you know, think about. And these are the conversations we definitely need to have. We have a gender bias, unfortunately. I've deliberately used this picture of a girl and a woman teaching because in most of our classrooms, we still have a challenge. Uh, you know, paradigm initiative programs, programs in the global south, and we are seeing in many countries where we work that there are, you know, there are communities where the girls are expected, unfortunately, to stay at home and do domestic, you know, chores while the boys are the ones allowed to go to classrooms. We need to make sure we overcome this gender bias. One way we have done that in our own work is to put women in front of women in the classrooms because representation matters. If a girl sees that a person teaching her is a woman, then she believes she can do it. Uh, but if all the time we have male teachers, then we have, you know, a problem. Policies are a challenge. It would interest you to know that in many countries where we work, I mean, we, we have offices in Cameroon, in Zambia, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Senegal, Kenya, and in many of the countries where we work across, you know, the African continent, Many of the governments have policies that say that children should learn, you know, how to use computers and how to use technology, you know, uh, how to use tech devices while, of, while in school, and they'll be tested based on it. But many of the schools do not have the equipment for them to learn that. And that is one way uh, that the divide continues because these kids learn theory, 
uh, and they don't know what the practical aspect is and of course language barriers. Uh, the reason why all of our work is done in English, French and Swahili and increasingly in Akan and in Aosan and other languages is because there is a major language barrier. I mean, English is still the majority uh, in terms of the language of content uh, on the internet and of digital devices and this obviously uh, needs to change. Uh, we need to be more deliberate about translating content into local languages so that people can learn. You know, my own story, and this is why I say that I'm personally, personally uh, excited to have this kind of conversations because this is my own story. Uh, in 1991, I was in GS3. I was a, you know, eagle-eyed 13-year-old who learned that in school had acquired two computers. And I went to the computer lab myself to learn how to use a computer. Uh, unfortunately, because there were two computers and it needed to be protected uh, by the teacher, uh, the teacher literally looked at me, I'm much taller than I was at the time, and said, oh, computers are not people like you, you can't understand how to use them. And I cried, of course, because I was disconnected from the opportunity to use, uh, you know, computers myself. Uh, but thankfully, uh, as a stubborn child uh, at that time, and I still retain a bit of that trait, I got my parents to pay for me to go to computer school. And of course, the way I did that, part of it was because um, they paid for me to learn, you know, the basic lessons and I, you know, stuck around the classroom of those who were learning advanced uh, computing and thankfully I got, I caught the attention of the owner of the computer lab who then invited me, you know, instead of allowing me to just play on the computers and destroy them because I didn't know how to do it, they allowed me to learn the things beyond what I paid for. And, but the reality is that not every child will be able to get those opportunities. In less than 10 years, by 2001, I was appointed Nigeria's IT Youth Ambassador. Uh, interesting enough, I was invited back to the same school uh, because obviously when your student, your ex-student is an IT ambassador, you invite them back to come and tell other students about the internet and how they can also become ambassadors and things like that. And guess who, who introduced me to the school or to the students? It was the same teacher who had, you know, denied me access. Uh, but this time the introduction was different. You know, what he said was, oh, we knew Benga when he was here. We always knew he was going to be a good representative. Of course, that's not true, but hey. That's, that's what happens. Uh, by 2011, we began to you know, run our programs across Nigeria, and I'm excited that through that program, we've been able to find not opportunities to just bridge digital divide, but also to bridge opportunity divides for young people. You know, I always tell the story of famous who came to our center, his parents are told him, you can't continue to go to school anymore, uh, because unfortunately, this is how much money we have, you can go to secondary school, and university is out of the question, go and walk. He came to our center, learned how to use computers, got an internship, got his first job, went to school, studied, you know, uh, medical biochemistry, graduated, got his first job, landed a big you know deal job at a big four consulting firm and as i speak to you today uh you know famous is a manager at kpmg in new jersey and that that for him changed his own story and changed the story of his entire family and that is in under 15 years this is what we can achieve when we consciously bridge digital divide which is why uh, my organization now does that across the continent so that we can connect more Benga Shesons, more Famouses, and more Esthers, and more boys and girls to digital opportunities so that they can, they can improve their lives and, of course, that of their families. You know, like I said earlier, I, I wish that COVID uh, was an opportunity uh, for us to learn the lessons that, you know, there's a major digital divide. Uh, but what we are seeing in our report, our paradigm initiative, uh, supported, you know, kindly by the Conservative Foundations, is that COVID was unfortunately a time not just when kids were not able to learn, many kids were not able to learn because they were not connected, many kids were not able to learn uh, because of on February policy, policies, but some of the things they learned, some of course, but, and that is another level, another layer of divide. Obviously, opportunity to focus on fixing gaps is what I believe that we should learn from this period we're emerging from. We need to fix policy gaps, we need to fix equipment uh, you know, or infrastructure gaps, and we need to fix the gap of opportunity, especially for young people in the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom 70%. And I, I'm deliberate in saying that because that, in fixing that, is how we fix many of the problems we face in our world uh, today. We believe in a holistic approach. Uh, it's not just about digital you know, literacy. Yes, we can put a man or a woman in front of the classroom. You can put uh, a young person who has been through the program before in front of the classroom, but you also need governments to participate. 
Because if government policy is one step forward and two steps backward, you will not make success. Uh, you know, achieve success in the work that you're doing. There, of course, has to be awareness by civil society. Uh, we started in training, you know, in 2007. We're 15 this year, and we've seen many organizations across the African continent, across the global south, you know, in, in Latin America, uh, even in Asia, doing a lot of the work that we do, uh, and some even doing a lot more in terms of numbers. And we're glad to see civil society organizations doing this. But like I said earlier, we need to begin to use local languages. We have to use local languages. And of course, we need to address the problems of social inequality, not just uh, addressing the problems uh, of social inequality uh, in the classroom, but even beyond the classroom. And we need affordable internet access. Uh, and I wanted to speak very quickly to an example from uh, Nigeria. Uh, the country you know that i that i i, I live in uh you know because one of the, one of the things that we we can tell is that technology is not just a subject in the curriculum but it's also an opportunity for us to fix many of the gaps that we have uh in nigeria for example more than half a million uh you know we have a capacity for about 620,000 uh 612,557 uh, young people to get into universities but three times that number, 2.1 million of those who write exams. And so you can never build enough schools for obvious reasons. You can never build enough schools, uh, but clearly uh, you need to be able to use technology as an opportunity. The world is a global village. Uh, and of course, we need to acknowledge this divide because if we play the ostrich, we're not helping ourselves. Uh, you know, understanding how the internet works and understanding user data, you know, uh, we need to, of course, also focus on how to play safe on the internet, how to teach young people who are coming online, how to be safe on the internet, and also protecting their data. This is this is one of the key reasons why the work we do at Part Initiative focuses on digital rights to make sure that we're not just connecting young people to the internet, uh, but at the same time we're making sure that as they get connected, they are also able to, uh, you know, stay safe online and that their data is protected uh you know i i look forward to you know the follow-on conversation that, that we will have uh on this and and i trust that it, you know in that conversation there will be other people who have questions and other contributions to this topic uh but thank you for having me thank you very much mr sasan uh we will turn next to sun young bian Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Uh, I'm Professor Sun Young Byun at the Seoul National University of Education in Korea. I'm honored to make a presentation at the International Conference on Global Citizenship Education. Uh, let me begin my presentation titled AI Ethics and AI Citizenship Education based on AI literacy and competencies. The main contents of my presentations are as follows. The first half of my presentation is devo devoted to the duality of AI and the characteristics of, of AI ethics and values and principles of ethical guidelines of Europe, UNESCO, and Korea. The second half uh, would be about the difference between digital literacy and AI literacy and uh, the reason of why we need AI ethics and education and the concepts of AI competencies and AI literacy. I want to start, I would like to start my presentation by quoting uh, Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche observed that the crisis of modern society and civilization is originated from the humanization of nature. And the postmodernity emerged from the dehumanization of nature and the naturalization of humans. Now in the age of AI, it's the task of modern ethics to ethically reflect on the efforts of modern people to explore new humanity from traditional humanity. For example, uh, digital humanism or transhumanism, while surfing the wave of humaniz humanization of machines and mechanization of humans. Uh, 
Any attempt to consider AI ethics seriously should face a potential issue, which I call the duality of AI. Although AI may perform a function corresponding to an agent with social or moral or uh, legal influence, it's not an independent autonomous entity that can take moral legal responsibility for its operation or the results of its actions. AI has its artificiality, it has recognition of the fact that that is a product of, by human. And, uh, and the other fact is that agency or autonomy, uh, that implies responsibility. The recognition of this duality is the background that calls for the necessity of AI ethics. AI ethics shares its territory with the philosophy of science and technology and also practical ethics. Also, AI ethics is future-oriented and post-anthropocentric. And AI will not be as moral as humans, but it will play the role of agents like humans. If the actions of AI exerted a moral influence on people, the possibility that these actions of AI will be considered moral would increase. So we can grant AI a delegated autonomy or a quasi-autonomy. Uh, we are expected to go back and forth between the inconvenience of the uncanny valley and the convenience of overtrusted peak for the time being. Uh, the values emphasized in the European ethical guideline for trustworthy AI are firstly human dignity, uh, freedom of the individual, respect for democracy, justice, and the rule of law, equality, non-discrimination, and solidarity. And finally, citizens' rights. Four ethical principles in the context of AI systems. Uh, four, ethical, uh, four ethical principles are emphasized in this ethical guideline, uh, the trustworthy AI. These are the principles of respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, and explicability. The values emphasized in UNESCO's AI recommendation are as follows respect, protection, and promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms and human dignity. Environment and ecosystem flourishing, ensuring diversity and inclusiveness, living in peaceful, just, and interconnected societies. The UNESCO uh, recommendation, the UNESCO's recommendation on the ethics of AI set out various principles, including proportionality and do no harm, safety and security, and so on. Of course, the presentation of these values and principles has a strong declarative meaning and shows limitations in that it is difficult to be consistent or systematic due to the diversity of political and economic levels in each country. In particular, it should be said that there is an open discussion on the resolution of conflicts between values or possible conflicts between principles. Nevertheless, it will have practical, practical meaning in that it makes very strong recommendation for policy. Policy issues in the areas of ethical impact assessment, ethical governance and management, data policy, data ethics, and so on. These issues uh, present issues that the countries should seriously consider in the future in the age of AI. In Korea, too, in 2020, a human-centered ethical standard for AI was promulgated. These standards of AI ethics consist of three basic principles and ten core requirements. The most uh, important value is the uh, humanity. And uh, the basic principles are the principle of human dignity, the principle of the public goodness of society, 
and last the principle of the purposiveness of technology and the, the 10 requirements are human rights privacy respect for diversity uh, non infringement publicness solidarity data governance responsibility safety transparency yeah Uh, looking at recent uh, research trends in the field of AI ethics, we are making ethical certification programs based on ethical guidelines. And we are preparing ethical checklists for each field and standardization of AI ethics. Recently, the problem of learning data and evaluation data for AI has become a major issue in this field. Now we move to the second half of my presentation. We can know the change of the new paradigm in the age of AI through various phenomena. At first, uh, looking at EU's trust towards AI and UNESCO's AI ethics recommendation, we know that the world is now changing very quickly due to the emergence of the new technology AI. Secondly, we can see the growing role of AI in civil society. For example, AI society is a complement to representative democracy, that is the direct democracy or participatory democracy. And second, the increasing the reality of AI democracy, uh, debates using metaverse debates or uh, the public opinion, uh, making public opinion using metaverse, the emergence of digital politicians. And thirdly, possibility of transition of AI from a democracy assistant to a decision maker in policy. Thirdly, AI is playing the role of transforming the traditional state-centered civic, edu civic education framework into the global citizenship framework. And fourthly, beyond the level of replacing an analog with the digital, AI is expanding from the role of an assistant in knowledge production and consumption to the role of the subject which can produce knowledge. Uh, the Bokman Klein Center had analyzed the 36 ethical guidelines in 2020. Since then, several countries and organizations are still making their ethical guidelines. The reason why this flood of ethical guidelines occurs should be considered as a good reason that shows the difference between the digital age and the AI age. Regarding this rapid change, the need for discussion of AI citizenship is raised from another aspect of digital citizenship performance that has been discussed in information ethics. As society changes from the industrial age to the digital age, digital literacy and digital ethics are necessary for the digital age. So, in the future society, AI literacy and AI ethics will be essential to use AI correctly. We need to extract the elements of AI competency and AI citizenship from the ethical principles presented in various ethical guidelines for AI and provide citizenship education with these elements as the main content. Although AI citizenship education can be broadly included in digital education, it is emphasized in that it shows a qualitative difference between the existing internet-based society and AI-based society. Because AI systems are changing the platform itself beyond the level of hardware and software, we need to find out what competencies or what values are required of citizens by the emergence of such a system. AI citizenship education that teaches the ability to find the solutions and decide alternatives to various social problems that may arise in the future society where AI systems begin to operate in early stage necessary. There are competencies that need to emphasize 
in AI citizenship education. For example, uh, the firstly, the competencies to manage AI systems and operations so that human dignity and autonomy are respected in human AI interactions. The secondly, the competencies to prevent the harm. The thirdly, the competencies to establish procedures, standards that can institutionally guarantee the explainability of AI system. The fourthly, the competencies of fairness. Uh, so uh, AI competency uh, uh, is, I think, divided into AI technical competency and AI ethical competency. And uh, also should be distinguished from the developer and user perspectives. But in practice, technical competency and ethical competency must be educated at the same time in the course of education, uh, in, in the classroom, I mean. Yeah. AI technical competency consists of three competencies, data competency, algorithmic competency, and model utilization competency. Uh, AI technical competency is important, but AI ethical competency related to the ethical basis for using AI correctly is also necessary. Just as AI, techno, uh, AI technical competency is divided into competencies required of developers who develop, make, sell, and provide the AI-related services, and of AI users in general, in general. AI ethical competency is also divided into competencies required for developers and users. So, uh, uh, I, uh, 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 AI ethical competency uh, consists of three competencies, uh, cognitive, and uh, uh, critical, and creative ethical competency. Few words are used in a variety of fields as much as literacy. As such, the term literacy can be expanded into new literacy, such as media literacy, digital literacy, data literacy, information literacy, computer literacy, and finally AI literacy. There are so many literacy, I think. The, the scope of the concept of literacy is getting wider. I think the most basic of AI competencies can be called uh, the most basic of AI competencies can be called AI literacy. AI literacy fundamentally includes competencies that involve data, algorithm, modeling, and ethical implications on humans and society. So we can define uh, AI literacy as the ability to use AI in daily life and professional activities, knowing what AI can do and what it needs to be, and what it needs to do, ethically considering the impact of AI on humans and societies. Uh, this figure is created to show that AI technical competency, the left side, the technical competency, TC, and the right side is uh, ethical competence, EC. Yeah. So AI TC and AI EC should be taught at the same time based on AI literacy. Yeah. The center is the AI literacy, data, algorithm, modeling, and social and ethical impact. Yeah. I believe that uh, not technology-driven education, but competency-based AI ethics education that involves the proper use of AI and the proper adaptation to the AI era should be introduced into the school. I think that global citizenship education needs to proceed in the direction of AI citizenship education based on AI ethics. I would like to end my presentation by emphasizing the need to contemplate the meaning of humanity once again 
in the modern trends that pursue the humanization of machines and the mechanization of humans. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Brand, for your presentation. Uh, we will turn next to Diego Monrique. Great, thank you. So, yeah, I think you can see the screen now. So, hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on who people are connecting from. It's a pleasure to be in the conference this year again. So, I will be doing a short presentation. Uh, and actually, I just want to start by just sharing a little bit about the process of thinking about this title in the presentation, uh, because I think it's important. And as I was preparing for this presentation, and as you can see from the title of the session, addressing emerging issues, digital divide, polarization, and the emergence of new ethics and digital citizenship, I was having a hard time framing what I wanted to convey. And then uh, there was something in the back of my mind that wasn't sitting right. And the reason for it is that I kept on thinking that these are actually not really emerging issues, but rather we're seeing expressions of these issues in the digital dimension now. And I'm pretty happy about uh, the presentations from our two panelists earlier, because I think they gave us a really good overview of how things are transforming. But I think uh, we, uh, or I would like in my presentation to maybe take us a step back and to see from a global citizenship or education perspective, what is it that we're maybe, or that we should consider earlier, uh, because then all of these issues we have been living with for a while. So this is what I decided to call the presentation, not so emerging issues, but in an emerging digital dimension. So just to have a quick overview of what I will discuss, uh, I will first start by talking a little bit about this old issues in an emerging digital dimension. I'll briefly talk also about what, how are youth affected differently so as you know, I represent the GCD Youth Network, and I'll particularly like to uh, highlight a few things about how youth are affected differently regarding this topic. I'll also cover how we as young people or youth in general are also not just passive actors, but rather act active actors that are influencing and engaging in the emerging digital world, as well as <clears throat> uh, this question that I would uh, like just to start thinking even now if we're preparing global citizens in the digital world, are we ready for this? Is, is When is the right time? What is, what is it that we need for that? And just some ideas about what comes next. So let's start by uh, taking a quick look about some of the old issues in new dimensions and this type, this type uh, digital dimension. So if we look at this four or five different uh, concepts or ideas, so digital divide, polarization, ethics, and notions of citizenship, uh, these are all, in one way or another, all questions of power. And the reason why I say this is because uh, I'd like to frame it in this way, because we're, all of these things are not entirely new, but we're now seeing different expressions of this uh, reflected online and digital spaces on the different types of interactions that we have in digital uh, platforms, et cetera. So if we consider, for instance, digital divide, and I think we had a great explanation of the different elements that we should consider for the digital divide in the first presentation. But if we see all of this, now we're talking about digital divide, but the divide has been there for a long time. So the disparities, the inequalities that we've seen between global north, global south, men, women, rural and urban settings, et cetera, we've been there and we've seen those before. It's just that now we're seeing them transition into a different dimension. Polarization, I think the same, the same rule would apply. Oh, we're now seeing, and I'll give you a few examples later, about how the polarization is also ha is also not new. It's just that now we have to figure out how to deal with polarization on digital spaces, which is increasingly complicated due to the different uh, and very rapidly changing innovations in technology and communications, for instance. And then when it comes about ethics and the notions of citizenship, I think we had a great example just right now about the AI ethics and AI competencies, etc which to me really sound uh, as if we were talking a lot about the future, but this is not the future, this is today. Uh, so we are already talking about all of these things, but before I think we talk about this, or at the same time as we're talking about this from a digital point of view or this digital transformation, I'd like to remind again that these are all questions of power and there's a few things that I think global citizenship education can help us uh, understand and work on. So, 
if we look at all of these issues from a global citizenship education lens, and particularly from the three different dimensions of global citizenship education, so behavioral, social, emotional, and cognitive, these are all complex issues that we're dealing with already every day and that we have been dealing with for a while, but we're now seeing them reflected in our digital interactions. So if we were already dealing with them and GCD was a good tool that we could use in the offline space, then how can we now leverage all of these frameworks into then kind of operationalize uh, the GCD framework into the digital uh, interactions and the digital spaces that we're interacting now. So I think as we do that, uh, there's two or three things that we should consider and ask ourselves that we are already doing, uh, maybe not so good in some instances, uh, but that we should not forget before we start now considering about the digital transformations. So whose voices are not, are we not listening to? Whose voices are silent? Whose voices are not represented? As well as which groups are least represented and beyond identifying who they are, also trying to understand why. So for instance, if we talk about digital divide, it's not just about who has access and who doesn't have access, or affordability and the different aspects that we heard before, but also why, what are the underlying causes and who is the actor that could have the most influence into changing the status quo of that. Also, which uncomfortable conversations can GCD help us to navigate? And I think I'd particularly like to highlight this because to me, global citizenship education is a great tool to have uncomfortable discussions, particularly discussions around power. And as we all know, I think uh, talking about power is generally something uncomfortable that most people will try to avoid because it's not easy to approach these conversations. But I think that global citizenship education can help us do this, whether it is from the interconnectedness or interdependence uh, side of global citizenship education, whether it is from cross uh, cultural understanding, for instance, whether we start a conversation around tolerance as a core value of global citizenship education and so on. I think we have a great opportunity, a great tool here to be able to navigate these conversations that need to happen so that when or as we start already to discuss about citizenship in a digital world, uh, we are uh, kind of preparing ourselves in the way that we're dealing with things even offline so that then they, we do not keep on replicating these things online at the same time. And I think uh, thinking about these three questions, uh, we have in front of us an ideal moment to tackle the persisting issues that we're seeing because we have uh, uh, the most diverse and informed and literate society that uh, we've ever had. I know that this doesn't reflect the reality of a lot of communities, of a lot of people. There's still significant gaps to address regarding education and access, et cetera. But uh, I, I think if we constantly keep on saying, so when is the moment then? Are we ready now? Or are we not ready? So then from my point of view and, and trying to think about this from global citizenship education, I'll definitely say that the moment is now. Then the question is how? And I think uh, we're starting to get a lot of different ideas about how we can do this, how we can navigate this transition into a digital world with these presentations, but also with this whole conference. So let me move to the next uh, slide. And I wanted to briefly touch upon how youth, not only youth, but particularly youth are disproportionately affected by the different issues that we're seeing now reflected in the digital scenario, the digital world. And uh, as I think we are all to some extent familiar, like you know, oftentimes when we talk about digital, uh, this often gives us the idea that uh, digital can mean to some extent more inclusive, more participatory approaches, more participatory spaces. And the transition towards digital, however, affects groups differently. So this uh, the, the approaching inclusivity and participatory uh, approaches or spaces is increasingly being done, but there's still a lot of things that are affecting different groups in a different way. Uh, and when it comes to youth, there's at least three or four things that I wanted to highlight. And I think we heard a little bit about this story on the, uh, or a similar story that would match this in the first presentation. So first of all, youth, uh, and I think this is not a surprise, but it's something to highlight, are often um, or have often less power or less, less access to resources and influence. Uh, as we heard in the, in the example in the first presentation, and I really enjoyed that, so thank you. Uh, it's not as easy uh, to navigate the spaces that get to decide who and which voices, who, who, which actors get to participate in this whole process of transformation into digital technologies and so on. 
So this leads to the second point, which is that uh, adult, the, adult, the fact that adult-led and adult-centered systems are predominant in the, both education sectors and decision-making spaces in academia, et cetera. So therefore, all of the spaces where we're expecting for youth to thrive are really not responsive in many cases to what you need and to the different approaches in which youth can not just learn, but also thrive the most when it comes to digital transformation and digital citizenship, we want to consider that as well. So therefore, this we need to think about this and, and act upon it. Uh, it's also important to understand that uh, youth often need to quickly adapt to rapidly changing needs when it comes to the digital transformations as well. So for instance, being constantly updating their skills to, to, be, to learn for education in general, uh, to also be able to uh, quickly update their skills for to fitting to the job market, to update and be up to date uh, with their communication channels and so on. And I know that you might be probably thinking, but youth are quite used to the, this days, but this is not the reality for everyone. And the fact that the, you need to constantly update yourself it, in a way, it also means that you're never ready enough. So then what is the balance and how can you, how can you navigate that scenario? And uh, last but not least, also the fact that there is a lot of restrictive and non-responsive spaces, spaces for youth to engage in. So related to the second point, if we are expecting the youth to thrive in this different spaces, uh, both offline and, off and online, and considering these four key themes that we're discussing in this presentations, uh, it's really complicated to navigate spaces when really it's not responding to the different ways and the different approaches in which youth can thrive the most in it. So this is also something to consider. And a lot of these things would apply similarly to other groups if we consider, for instance, women or people with disabilities and so on. So it's also about uh, not just understanding who and how this is affect affecting particular groups, but also across groups. So if we move to the next slide, I would briefly uh, just talk about four different ways or four different reasons maybe why uh, you should not only think about youth as passive actors in this transformation into digital and considering this particularly from a global citizenship education perspective, but rather as active uh, actors that are influencing and engaging in all these spaces. So first of all, uh, if we look at the different, uh, different studies on trends on youth participation, we can see that youth these days are engaging in their own terms, in different terms. So there is new participation dynamics that we should consider as we discuss all these topics. So in most cases, uh, youth are now more engaged or more prone to participate in, in, in initiatives or actions that would create a more immediate and more shorter term impact and that they can see visible uh, impact in shorter term than before. So it's not about participating in traditional spaces such as, for instance, before uh, like engaging in a civil society organization or a political party, for instance, but rather more immediate and more shorter term uh, initiatives or, or mechanisms. Therefore, we need to understand this because then we need to meet people where they are. And in this case, youth in particular, when we talk about all of this topic, it's important to understand how they would engage and why. It's also about innovation and creativity. So. Uh, if we look at uh, the tech industry, if we look at the decision making spaces where there is more uh, influence and innovation around uh, digital transformation and so on, we often find younger people. And this is because they're a very, uh, I would consider, I would say we are often active drivers of innovation in key sectors, and particularly in this case, education and communications, for instance. Uh, it's also about understanding the multiplicity or multiple roles that youth play in this, uh, in this part of uh, transformation uh, from education perspective, but also outside of education, beyond education. So youth often play more than one role at a time. So they, they can be learners, they can be also professionals, they can be caregivers, consumers, users, etc. So it's about understanding the dynamic in which uh, we operate uh, and not just consider as a static actor. Also, it's uh, uh, the, the world today is predominantly young. So uh, globally, I mean, depends on how you define youth, but we have the youngest population ever. So I think it only makes sense. And I think this, this idea comes often in this type of, type of presentations, but it only makes sense then to address this key group of stakeholders, given that it's a majority and that the, as you can consider from the previous point, uh, we are having different roles that are key uh, in, in this transformation from offline into online or to digital. 
And um, as we move ahead, I was considering when I was preparing this presentation, like, are we ready for this uh, transformation? It's already happening, but are we ready for it? Uh, and I just want to highlight a few points. I won't go too much into the new ethics or digital citizenship aspect, because I think also the other presenters cover that quite well. Uh, but just to give you some examples to consider. So when we talk about digital divide, uh, we have even today, or at least up until 2021, 2.9 billion people that still don't have access to, uh, to, to the internet, for instance. Therefore, there's a lot of questions that are raised there. The, are we ready to, to start having these conversations around uh, digital citizenship, uh, about the, this whole transformation, about the emerging, uh, the emerging dimensions for old issues, when there are still so many people, for instance, if we consider digital divide only, that are still not part of these conversations, that are still not part of what's going on. Therefore, what, what, what's the best way to do this? And then if we consider, for instance, polarization, and if we look at the different indexes uh, from across the globe, uh, there is for, I would say, the past eight to 10 years, uh, like all the indexes are showing, a decreasing, a decreasing number in supporters of democracy, for instance. And the polarization narratives, polarization discourses are increasing more and more. Uh, therefore, uh, are we ready also to, to discuss, uh, are we ready to also transition into the digital dimension of these issues, uh, when we are also seeing uh, the contrary of what we're probably expecting. And then we have today, as, as you know, I think we're all pretty aware, uh, the issue of, for instance, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, etc., that's also contributing to polarization. And this is only also important to highlight that the fact that we have all these digital spaces or digital interactions today, they're not limited to what happens online, but it's also affecting what happens offline. Even those that are not part of the uh, digital spaces are also affected by what happens online. So there's also questions, questions about ethics there then. Like, what, when do we draw a line? Uh, what, do we need new ethical frameworks and how does our framework look like? So again, as well, when we talk about digital citizenship, there's a lot of questions that we could raise there. But for the sake of time, I'll move to the last slide. And I just want to highlight five points um, in the context of global citizenship education that I think can help us navigate what we're currently dealing with. First of all, is to really stress and, re and focus on the appreciation of diversity and mutual understanding. So to go really and try to foster interdisciplinary efforts, initiatives, cross-sectoral and uh, different efforts that are beyond ethnicities or borders. And this is easier said than done. I think uh, a lot of us are already doing or trying to do so uh, to some extent or to another, but I think we really do need to keep this in mind as we move forward if we do not want to keep on replicating the same or carrying the same issues with us. Uh, then also interdependence and interconnection. So those are key aspects of global citizenship education. But I think today, particularly, I would highlight the idea of going beyond understanding the local relationships that we have into trying to exploit their potential. I'd also like to focus on, or for us to, to convey the idea for us to focus on sustainability and transformative efforts for all. So I think in this regard, considering what I mentioned about power around the different structures, about who takes the decisions and so on, it's really important that we focus on uh, discussing uh, not just how things work, but then why. And in that regard, we need to address the governance structures that we operate in on all of these topics and also talk about localization and power balances or imbalances. Uh, also something similar to what another presenter spoke about to have an holistic approach on learning. And I think particularly going back to these three dimensions of social, emotional, behavioral, and cognitive, I think we have a, a good compass here of what are the different uh, aspects that we should consider and how to move forward. And last but not least, uh, I think when we are working in this space of global citizenship education, development, uh, tech, et cetera, uh, it's, and we're, we're doing, dealing with a lot of things that we did not know before. Therefore, failure is just natural. And I think we are talking very little about failure. And in that regard, uh, failure without learning is just failure. But I think if we are able to learn from it, then this becomes knowledge and experience. And I think this is key. Uh, so I think we need to talk more about that and embrace what happens and learn from it. So I will stop it here. I just want to thank you. And this is my contact information. If you have questions or comments, and you can also see the website of the GCDU network if you want to know more about this. 
So thank you and back to you. Thank you, Mr. Monrique and Mr. Sonsan, and also Professor Bjorn for your excellent presentations. Uh, you've diagnosed uh, many of the problems for us around polarization and the digital divide, uh, and you've offered some uh, responses in terms of the values that could help guide our work in response to this. Uh, so now we're going to hear from our discussant this evening. So Rachel Parker is going to give us about 10 minutes of response and raise some questions for us. Thank you, Professor Kester, and thank you for our, um, our fantastic presentations this evening. They were really interesting. Um, I've prepared some short summaries of the presentations, and it will give you a great opportunity to see whether I've understood uh, your presentations correctly. Uh, Mr. Sessan, you presented us on the things that keep us apart when it comes to digital technology and your own journey to becoming an advocate of digital literacy in a context where access and rights are held by some, but not all. You spoke about the opportunities COVID-19 presents, bringing awareness to the digital technology access and rights gap. You talked about a process where all stakeholders sign on to a holistic approach, where digital technology is a tool to address language and equity issues. You maintain that tech is a tool to scale opportunity, not a learning area, and thus it cuts across curricula. You finished with some thoughts on how digital citizenship bridges, across, bridges the access divide, including educating ourselves about equity and safe and ethical use. I hope that summarised your presentation. Professor Bjorn, you took us on a comprehensive journey from AI ethics to AI citizenship, education and AI literacy. You introduced us to the construct of AI, where it originated and the complexity of AI as an idea, that it requires an ethical lens through which to view it. You shared the different typologies of AI and ethics and human rights and ethical principles in relation to AI and AI systems. You presented four core values, human rights, environmental flourishing, inclusion and peace in relation to AI ethics and these strongly align with the core principles of global citizenship. You presented a series of principles recommend, recommended for AI ethics, which can be used by organisations as a framework for policy and practice. You talked about Korea's ethics standards when it comes to AI and how these intersect. You presented the recent trends in AI ethics and how digital literacy intersects and how AI ethics and literacy are an important capability currently and into the future. This takes us to AI citizenship education, an important cross-curricular learning area where knowledge, skills, values related to AI citizenship could support solutions to global problems. You describe the technical and ethical competencies associated with AI citizenship education, which have three sub-components. You describe the concept of AI literacy as a basic level AI competency. You concluded by presenting the future where AI literacy and citizenship will be increasingly important to access certain careers. I hope I did a good job of summarising your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Mr Manrique, you presented on how the past and present intersect regarding digital technology and how young people's place and status in this world. You talked about how inequality, conflict, global issues are all played out in digital technology and young people are disproportionately affected by the digital divide in that they have less power, resources and influence. You described four ways in which young people are important actors in this space and the core areas where digital and global citizenship collide, access, polarisation, ethics and citizenship. You presented five things we can do now to address these issues related to inclusivity, understanding interdependence, sustainability, holistic learning and the power of reflection. So what I feel combined these presentations, all of them had ethics, Professor Bjorn, equity, Mr. Sassan, and inclusion, Mr. Manrique, at the heart of them, bringing the humanity to technology. Can I ask all presenters and all can engage with this question of what is needed to ensure that digital technology users have an understanding of the skills and values of these areas? Uh, 
Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to uh, ask each of our presenters now to respond to the question uh, that Dr. Parker just raised. Uh, and if I could ask, if, if you would read the question one more time, Dr. Parker, for each of the presenters, and then we'll go in order of presentation. So we'll ask if uh, Mr. Sasan will respond first, uh, and then Professor Bian, and then Mr. Monrik. Thank you. So my question was what is needed to ensure that digital technology users have an understanding of these issues, equity, ethics, inclusion, uh, at the heart of digital technology use? And Mr. Thank Sasan, you. it's to you. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, for, for equity, I, I think, you know, that we don't need to even ask users to sort of <laughs> develop an understanding of it because for much of the world this is their lived experience right that they, they do not see equity uh, in access in the cost of access uh, but when we when we then get to the conversation about ethics that's that's a different ball game because unfortunately because many times much of the research and much of the work uh, that is being done towards new technologies uh, artificial intelligence and all of that because that is done mostly uh you know uh a bit far from 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 the global south from people who have those lived experiences then you don't have an opportunity for them to make inputs into the process uh, and because of that you don't have all of those conversations as a truly global conversation so you have a few centers uh, you know, excellence across the world having these conversations. And because of that, uh, you know, many times we talk about the, the problem of, you know, of a scarcity mentality. Uh, so for someone who has not had internet access all their lives, when you give them something that looks like access, they take it. Uh, you know, there was a time when a certain platform, I don't want to mention names, uh, came up with a project called internet.org, <laughs> and I'm sure many wouldn't know that already now, uh, and, and introduced people to, that was their first experience with the internet. And nobody was asking questions about privacy and security. And when we began to ask questions about privacy and security, uh, the challenge and, you know, the challenge thrown to us was, why are you asking questions about security when people have not even had access? But I think we now have an opportunity not only to connect people to opportunities, but to connect them with all of the considerations, including equity, uh, including ethics, and including all of the other things we need to have conversations about. And of course, three ways to do this. Number one is never to ignore lived experience. Uh, lived experience means that there are people who, when you're designing processes, if you don't factor the lived experience in it, then you will design and they will not be able to use. Uh, there are many platforms that are designed for fast internet access. I struggle with them because my office is in Lagos, Nigeria, where unfortunately I don't have good access. But if you consider my lived experience in your design, you won't design only for fast internet access. That's number one. Uh, number two is an opportunity to contribute to the process. Uh, because of the nature of my work, I get access to many of those global conversations. But many times, these conversations happen in, you know, in capital cities where people don't have access to. And because of that, they do not embrace what would have been ethical considerations or what would have been lived experience considerations uh, from many others. But the third is for us to make sure that we don't only have conversations in silos. I love having conversations about a digital divide. But I've been having this conversation since 2001, since you know 21 years now. And many of those things, the needle hasn't moved on them. So we need to make sure that all of the conversations we have on this uh, in this conference today are possibly followed up with action and tied to measurable objectives. Thank you. Professor Bian. Uh, yeah, thanks for your good summary. Uh, summary. And then the question is the yeah I I I think that moral values is uh, most important thing in education. But I think that we can teach moral values as, for example, humanity, with AI, or in the context of AI, because the 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 meaning of human dignity. Uh, in former uh, four years, uh, for ten years or hundred years ago, is different the meaning of uh, human dignity in uh, now. So uh, we uh, we can teach moral values with uh, uh, use of uh, AI. So uh, I think that uh, 
uh, we we have not yet uh, independent subject of AI ethics, but I think the fusion uh, or the fusion the subject we can teach the AI ethics education. So with a moral value. When I uh, when I ask the meaning or meaning of a robot or a, uh, AI, and the answer goes to the meaning of humans back. So. I think the human values and AI going together. So it is important to teach the both of them in the same classroom, in the same time. Yeah, that is my answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Manrique, if you'd like to respond to Dr. Parker's question. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, I'm actually struggling with this question because I don't think I, I have a concrete answer. And the reason for that is that I guess like like equity ethics and inclusion are all different to for everyone and I particularly like the the term that uh, was used before about lived experiences and I think that's exactly where we can start so it's probably not about what is needed but how and I think then this how and the what really does depend a lot because if we go back for instance to the digital divide aspect like how like if digital divide is not relevant for me because I haven't even accessed before as it was mentioned then then how, like why this is relevant for me, I think. So then the what and the how for me, I think it starts to make, like by making this relevant and to make this relevant, I think we then need to start by addressing some of these gaps that I mentioned that happened even earlier, uh, that are even before the digital, the digital transition. So I think if we start looking at the, uh, the, the, the root causes of all these gaps, of all these issues that we've had for a while, and then we start tackling them even offline, then we're gonna start also seeing the reflection of these efforts online or digital spaces. Uh, because again, uh, I, cannot, I cannot want something that I don't know in, that, in a way. Uh, and I think the, this question about, is also, is, it also raises a lot with quality and standards and, and sort of protection and well being in the sense that as the previous example was also given, like uh, I can accept anything if I, don't, if I didn't have a standard to compare to before. So then it's really important that we are that we have high standards, but to have high standards, we need to then start from the from scratch and, and addressing all these gaps that we had or we're, that we're still living with. So I don't think I have a concrete answer to that. It just keeps me, it just gets me thinking. I would just hope also that others that are watching are also thinking and reflecting about this. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions from the audience now, so I'm going to uh, read these out. And our first question is to Professor Sunyun Byun. Uh, and so the question is from Eugene Kwan, and this is the, the question. Uh, Professor Byun, can you say that AI further develops, as it further develops, we need to put more weight on moral and ethics education to students? before teaching them digital ethics and competency. So for example, uh, moral teachings such as humanity should come before digital education, but would this be possible in the current system and trend of education? Yep, uh, good questions. Uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we should not divide the technical uh, size and ethical size. We should, now we should teach the both sides in simultaneously. So, so uh, I, uh, uh, I studied uh, 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 AI competencies and then many uh, specialists uh, say, uh, say that uh, technical competencies and ethical competencies both are very important to live in the uh, AI generation. So I think that uh, the, which is the first is that uh, important question. I think that the uh, value and technique go together. So uh, in, uh, now in Korea, uh, uh, we have no independent subject of AI but we have some subjects uh, which, uh, which are uh, ethics or uh, computer science or informatics. Uh, so we can teach the 
many AI classroom or lessons. Last year and this year, we have many AI ethics textbooks and many programs by in education government and then many neighbor and 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 this company has the course of AI ethics. So we need to. Consider the both uh, 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 elements together. So that is my uh, uh, answer. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the next question is to Mr. Gabenga Sasan, and the question is from Al Maruf Muhammad, uh, and they ask: There is no doubt that the digital divide is a major issue to contend with. In many of the schools in the developing world, what does the Paradigm Initiative have in place to support schools and teachers that would want to help their students to overcome the digital divide? Thank you. That's okay. Uh, well, the the what we have, uh, thankfully, we've been able to scale our work uh, beyond Nigeria. We started doing this work in Nigeria in 2007. Uh, I've now been able to scale this into six, uh, you know, six countries, and and it, the reason I'm smiling is because it's, it's a lot of work, and I'm sure you know everybody knows that uh, clearly because it's uh, the number of schools in one country alone and the number of teachers in one country alone is is massive, and we can't do it alone as part of initiative. Uh, but the, you know, the kind of structure uh, that we have in place is number one: we make sure that you know students who are in schools do not miss out the opportunity uh, of getting access to digital education simply because they're in public schools. Now, that means that we have to, at times, take devices into their schools. That means that, at times, we have to get volunteers to go to their schools with devices to train them. That means, at times, we have to work with schools to make sure that they are able to use facilities that are close to them. Uh, you know, to be able to get access. Uh, and for teachers, we clearly, uh, you know, are very interested in working with teachers, uh, not just in training them, but also making them understand that they are no longer the, as you know, someone puts it, they're no longer the sage on the stage, digital instructions. They are now literally the guide by the side, uh, helping the students understand what is going on, introducing them to new experiences. So they don't have to know everything. It's fine for a teacher to say, let's, let's search for it online right and then guide the students because they know better they have better experience uh, through that process so for, for schools uh we provide support in terms of technical support in terms of you know uh, infrastructure support in terms of training support uh, and for teachers we focus very much on training uh, but like i said even if paradigm initiative got a billion pounds today uh we can't do that alone uh in all schools across the entire uh, you know, global south. So we need we need governments working in this area to scale. We need businesses investing, uh, tech companies, platforms. We need other civil organizations also strengthened uh, to be able to do this work. Thank you. Okay, and I think we may have uh, another question from the the audience. Uh, this one is to Diego Manrique. And is there an author on this one? No? OK. Uh, sorry, give us a second. Um, OK, so Diego, the, the question is, uh, you presented youth as active actors influencing and engaging which I can also see in many youth activism. Yet, at the same time, we also find youth active in spreading disinformation, uh, or the disinfodemic, hate speech, etc. So youth being technologically savvy could go both ways. So could you share with us, if any, some interesting projects or activities in which youth successfully engage in dialogue with uh, young, uh, vulnerable youth uh, to assist in uh, encountering the spread of hate speech and of the infodemic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a great question. Um, and I think I'd just like to start by saying that I think we should try to ref probably refrain like from 
like blaming probably like misinformation or fake news on anybody because it's not really anybody's fault. Uh, it's really a matter of how uh, we deal with the information, how we consume information and so on. And this all depends on, on, on different factors. So I think uh, uh, the way, the, the reason why I was saying that youth are active actors in and engage in this, all these spaces is because it's the reality that I'm seeing uh, in the different spaces I participate. But it might also be true that some young people, as, as any older people, anybody, engages also with misinformation and disinformation, uh, maybe without knowing uh, in many, many cases. So I'd just like to start by that. And I think in terms of initiatives, I think there's many. Uh, I'd like to pr probably mention a few that we've worked together uh, to some extent with uh, the Asia Pacific Center for International Understanding, APSEU, uh, that are probably more focused on training uh, so, for instance, there is some online courses that are available on the GCD online campus that are for free uh, and that are targeting uh, young people to some extent uh, about how to identify, uh, for instance, fake news, uh, how to uh, modify your behaviors into consuming information online and so on. But I think if it comes to more like uh, more long term or local initiatives, I think there's many uh, that you can uh, look for. Uh, I, I cannot like tell them right now, like the different organizations, uh, but I think if this is a good way to start, if you would want to know more about where to start and who to work with, uh, the GCD online campus and the different courses that are offered on media and information literacy are a good starting point. Uh, or some of the other uh, projects that I've engaged with in, in, in my job uh, with uh, IRIX, uh, that you can also look up for Learn to Discern, which is an approach on media and information literacy that has been piloted and utilized in mostly Eastern Africa, but then now, uh, sorry, Eastern Europe, but now also in some African countries in Latin America, which is also a great approach uh, that can lead you to learn a lot of different initiatives. So I think uh, like, as uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, probably this is, not, this is not an individual thing, but rather a collective thing. So I think we should all learn together how to consume, how to be responsible in what we share. Uh, and I think this is unfortunately something that we're dealing too much with these days. Uh, but then I think uh, with together with the young people, it's not just about uh, what are they doing right or wrong, because then I think it also turns to this like uh, pointing fingers and even ethics questions like, okay, you're young, so you're not able to make mistakes because you're supposed to know what's true and what's not. But then who is and who is to be accountable for that also in special digital spaces. So I think there's a lot of there, we could probably talk about this question for a long time, but uh, I think those are a few initiatives or approaches that you can look into. Uh, and if you have more questions, um, I can also provide my contact information so we can talk further. Yeah, great. Thank you. And, and so if, if anybody does want to get in touch with us and ask for the contact information of any of the presenters, uh, please uh, add that question into the chat box and we'll get the emails back to you uh, after the session. Um, it, additionally, if there are any more questions that are coming out, do go ahead and put them into the chat box and we'll read them out in just a moment. We have approximately 12 minutes left of the session. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to offer some of my own reflections and comments back to each of the presenters uh, and then see if, if there's a question or a response that, that any of the presenters want to make. Um, so I, I want to begin with uh, Gabenga Sasan's uh, presentation. And there were two things that you, you pointed out for me. Um, uh, or that you emphasize for our audience. Uh, one, that it's critical that uh, young female students uh, have female teachers, and that uh, female teachers increase enrollment and attendance of female students in schools uh, because of increased representation. Uh, they see themselves, uh, young girls, see themselves within the, the education system. Uh, the parents themselves maybe have their own concerns of sending uh, young girls to the schools, uh, and so with the parents seeing female teachers in the institutions, that provides a degree of trust uh, in many of these contexts. And uh, there's been research elsewhere in Afghanistan that has also shown that the, the impact of female teachers uh, on getting young girls to enroll uh, in trust in their, uh, of the parents' trust is, is very critical. Um, and, and that research in Afghanistan was uh, prior to August 2021. Uh, 
the other thing that you pointed out that I thought uh, was really interesting, uh, Kabenga, uh, was the importance of local languages in the uh, language of instruction. So ensuring that the language of instruction is, uh, uh, allows for accessible education for a diverse community. And so I suppose here I'm going to raise a question for you and then I'll go to the other uh, uh, presenters and, and make my comments and questions uh, and we'll come back to you. Uh, I suppose here, uh, like the, the previous question that was asked to you, uh, are there any projects that you have going on uh, within your initiative that also involve multilingual uh, uh, access for students or are there multilingual programs uh, in the Paradigm Initiative? Um, and then let me go to uh, um, Diego Monrique next, because my comment and question for Professor Bjorn is a bit, a bit long uh, and convoluted, so uh, we got to get, get back to it. Uh, so Diego, um, uh, first the, the presentation on di uh, digital citizenship and, and youth activism and the, the, the sort of uh, the bringing together of those two is very important and empowering uh, for many young people around the world to, to affect change. And I think your response to the question that was just raised, that we have to be careful of, of blaming particular communities to be at fault for uh, post-truth or alt-facts is very dangerous. So that, that's a, a really important uh, warning that you were uh, issuing there. Um, you, you also raised the question uh, that is critical for all of us. In doing this work, whose voices are missing? Uh, who is represented, who is not represented? Uh, and I think raising those questions for us is a good uh, reminder, Diego. Um, you additionally said that global citizenship education might offer the space uh, for sensitively addressing controversial issues in education. Uh, and it certainly is our hope as global citizenship educators that that, that is the case. Uh, and, uh, and, and we, we work the best that we can to make sure that we can address difficult issues uh, and do so in a sensitive way that ensures that our education is both empowering and critical. Uh, the, the danger here, of course, as many of us know, is, is soft citizenship education that doesn't address critical political and social issues. Uh, and so uh, pointing out that importance of, of teaching controversial issues, uh, I found to be very uh, useful, so thank you. Um, and, and then uh, the last thing that you raised for me was, uh, again, the issue of challenging post-truth, alt facts, and, and fake news uh, that is exacerbating the polarization uh, in our communities. Now, I do have one question for you. It's a, it's a, little, it's a little open, uh, and, and I realized that um, uh, the, the language was also used by some of the other presenters, so this is sort of an open question for everybody. Um, my PhD students and I <laughs> are struggling with this, so I'm going to uh, ask it for you. Uh, you had mentioned Global North and Global South, uh, and so this was a language that uh, several uh, presenters had used. Um, but the question I think that comes out for us is whether this is empowering or disempowering language, and if the language itself, when we we sort of position groups or communities as Global North, Global South, uh, might itself be uh, slightly divisive. Uh, and so I'll just open that up for, for anybody to respond to. But that's, that was my question for you, uh, Mr. Monrique. So thank you again uh, for your, your points. I'm going to go back to Professor Bjorn, uh, and I'll try to make this quick. Um, so you, you were speaking about uh, uh, tech and AI, uh, and, and uh, primarily from the position of human centricity of the way that, that people affect uh, AI. Uh, and so I suppose my question here is, and I'm, I'm thinking from post-humanist perspectives, uh, whether it might run the other direction. So do, does tech and AI not have agency of itself? Um, so not, not simply that people are affecting the tech, but at a certain point the tech sort of takes on a life of its own. Uh, it, it has a certain degree of agency uh, against, against us. Uh, and so I think of a few points here, for example, like big data, uh, the way that big data and our search histories online uh, sometimes diagnose us with diseases before our doctors diagnose us with diseases. Um, and certainly that wasn't the purpose of that tech, uh, but sort of a life of its own that it, that it takes on. I think of targeted advertisements. So the way that technology, is, as we scroll through Facebook or, or Twitter or other sorts of, of uh, platforms, uh, they, they begin to target advertisements to us. 
And the targeting of those advertisements based off of our search history can sometimes out gay and lesbian youth who other members of the community, their families are not aware of this, but because of that targeted advertisement based off their search history. So there's, there's a vulnerability and a danger there. And the point that I'm bringing up is that the tech has an agency, maybe not a conscious agency, but an agency that, it, that it's uh, affecting on us. Uh, and I think Cambridge Analytica is a good, a good example here as well in the way that it, it really exposed the digital silos that we belong to. So in, in other words, my question for you is, uh, might the direction of agency run the other way from tech toward humans? And if so, then uh, how do we nurture this relationship in a positive manner? So those are my questions for each of you. Um, and uh, Rachel, I saw that you were raising your hand. Yes, thanks. Yes. So we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, I just really have a particular um, passion for addressing the question about Global South and Global North. <laughs> and I have done so in many conference and presentation situations because it, it makes my eye twitch, <laughs> to be honest, because I'm Australian, obviously, and I'm in the Global South, but not in the way that it's intended to mean. Um, that's part of the reason, but also um, having spent 20 years working in international development, um, and I see that those broadly dichotomous terms are so unhelpful when it comes to working, working together, partnering with other people, working together to solve, solve issues. They're really um, divisive terms, no better than uh, first world and third world or developing and developed country. I think it's all in the same basket of lumping large, diverse groups of people together for the purpose of... It, it's kind of like linguistic laziness in the sense because there are other more factual ways to talk about communities. Um, you may even use you know, World Bank terminology like low income, um, low to middle income, high income countries is a little bit better than global, global South and Global North. So that's why my hand went up because it's something that I feel quite passionate about. And I think these kinds of ways of describing people, um, giving them names is really important. Language is really important um, in education and broadly in global citizenship education. We've spent decades trying to frame it. So I think you know, starting with these terms is a really important place. Thank you for that uh, response. Um, and I think, uh, so Rachel has started us off here. So we'll go actually first to you, Mr. Monrique, if you'd like to continue that conversation about Global North and South. Yeah, no, so this is actually something that resonates with me a lot also. Like, this was not my bio, but I'm also studying development studies in Sweden at the moment. So this is kind of like my day-to-day -day, uh, reflection in a way. So I, I also, like what was just mentioned, makes a lot of sense to me. And I also do not, I actually avoid to the extent possible to make this, to use these terms because I actually do think they're divisive. Uh, I, however, haven't found a way to talk about this in a way that, makes sense to like this kind of uh, like this kind of discourse i think like even like the low income middle income like it also kind of like reflects like okay then you are considering that like a economical development sort of reflects whether you're a developer or not so i think there's always like a gray area in this i mean language matters i do agree uh i don't have an answer yet like what would be the best way to address this uh, but I think just going back to the polarization topic, I, I, I would say, yes, yeah, like this, having this global north, global south division is not helping us. Uh, and and we, we've had other other different terms before that were just just as bad, <laughs> let's say. So I think there is, this is a pending, a pending uh, thing to address, I guess, in the development uh, academic sector, probably. Uh, and, and just going back to what I was saying at the beginning, I think probably the reason why we haven't found something to address everyone in appropriate ways. Also because we've been like academia is such a restrictive space, like there's only a few, and you mentioned for instance, your, uh, your PhD students and yourself, but how many PH, I mean, how many people get to that level? Similar to the development aid space where I also work, but there's um, yeah, it's such a restrictive place. We find each other everywhere, all around the world. So I think we need to open this conversations to other spaces. Uh, but yeah, so far we, yeah, it's a divisive, divisive language, but we need to find a better solution, which I don't think I have an answer for now. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a, a point for us to continue to reflect on and, and think about uh, different ways to articulate it, but um, certainly not a critique of anybody here, just a, a, a useful conversation for, for us all to have. Uh, we're going to turn now to Professor Bjorn, uh, and we'll see if he has a response. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I, uh, uh, I understand the new questions, but uh, last year the, the super AI named Delphi can uh, can decide the moral judgment. For example, uh, killing bear for fun is morally bad, but killing bear for the life of baby is morally accepted. So uh, this super uh, AI can make moral decision, and so. Uh, uh, that is the why I call the duality of AI. AI uh, 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 is it, uh, made by humans. So it is a character of artificiality. Uh, so, but it seems to uh, do like humans. Uh, AI can many decisions and many actions on humans, and this influence this make. Uh, uh, for example, moral uh, influence or uh, social or emotional influence, then it can be the partner uh, of uh, uh, emotion exchange. So, so uh, we should monitor the life cycle of AI the in the uh, developing process and the using process and also in data. Uh, we, the, we, 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 we must the uh, learning data. We must check out the learning data, which this AI use uh, learn. So, I think the uh, we should monitor the entire process of AI from the beginning. And that is my uh, the answer. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Professor Bian. Uh, and I think we can continue this conversation after as well. Uh, we're, we're coming almost to the end of time, so I'd like to uh, turn over um, to Mr. Sasan to have him have his, his final words. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm enjoying this conversation. I, I, I wanted to, you know, sort of emphasize what Diego was saying about difficult conversations, and I think it's really important. Uh, you know, for many reasons. Uh, two of those reasons. Number one is the fact that we're in a very interesting political place in the world right now. Uh, you know, we just, of course, you know of the recent elections in Brazil, and we're talking about elections across the world. People are talking about the rise of the far right, they're talking about the you know, extreme left and things like that. And because of that, we have a lot of polarization, a lot of conversations in terms of content moderation. And guess what? This is happening at the same time when we were beginning to see, we just saw what happens to be a digital public good, a digital infrastructure, which is Twitter, go into private hands. There are many implications for that. Uh, there's a business argument for it. There are many arguments for it. But this is where we are in the world right now. And it, mean, it means we need to have difficult conversations about content moderation uh, and about policies around uh, you know, digital platforms. But having said that, I wanted to address very quickly, uh, as my last contribution, uh, your question about you know the need for multilingual uh, content. So you know you asked if we have a sort of product initiative. Yes, we do. I mean, our life training program which is our ten-week uh, training session for young people who are you know sort of in the bottom of the pyramid uh, is focused on English and French because of the countries we work in. But we're beginning to do a lot of trainings in Wolof, for example. Uh, our program in Senegal had to be done in Wolof, uh, you know, uh, and some of the content in the north of Nigeria had to be done in Ausa. Uh, our materials generally are translated into English and French because of the majority uh, languages, but also Swahili, uh, Akan, Aousa, and all of the other languages. We are premiering a short film. Uh, we, we produce an annual film to tell the story of the work we do around digital rights and inclusion, and we're doing the same on November 30 this year. Uh, and, and the film is always available in English, French, and Swahili. Why Swahili? Because we can have these conversations in many languages, but until we begin to have conversations and train in languages that people train in, 
that people, you know, sink in, that people have natural conversations in, we will just, in many cases, be having blah, blah, blah conversations and not getting to the root of the issues. So we need to have conversations and train people in languages they understand, languages they think in, and languages that their dreams come up in. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, that final uh, intervention. Uh, so we, unfortunately, we have to wrap up here, but uh, I'd like to give a big digital applause first uh, to Mr. Sasan, uh, Dr. Byun, Mr. Manrique, and uh, Dr. Parker. Um, so uh, thank you all. Uh, we appreciate your uh, contributions this evening. Uh, and this is the end of concurrent session 1.1. Uh, and it is also the end of day one of Icon GSED. Uh, so the next session will begin tomorrow at 3 p.m. in Korea and 7 a.m. in Paris. So thank you all again for being with us this evening. Come Sunday time.